Hello everyone, I'm Yasmin Taj, editor ETHR World International and head of branded content, The Economic Times. And it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this exciting video interview series brought to you by ETHR World Southeast Asia in collaboration with N Paradigm on the theme, Talent Management and Development for the Future of Work. Amidst rising talent scarcity and a receding global economy, Developing existing talent is one of the most crucial investments that organizations are making at the moment. The last couple of years have pushed us into ways of working that we never thought would be possible, but at the same time presented a tremendous amount of potential and opportunities that can be leveraged by all of us collectively to prepare for the future. As part of this interview series with N Paradigm, which is an experiential learning and talent intelligence technology company with 12 plus years of excellence with award-winning learning and assessment solutions, we will discover the core dynamics of the talent management function and also discuss how learning will be of paramount importance in helping us win over our future talent pipeline. And for this episode of the series, we are here in Singapore, extremely delighted to lead this conversation with two great leaders. I would like to welcome Suman Sharma, Global Head, Non-Mandatory Learning People Capability at Standard Chartered Bank Singapore, and also John Cherian, who's the CEO of N Paradigm. Suman and John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Great. Suman is a strategic L&D professional and a people capability builder with over 19 years of proven track record of working with multinational organizations in key business functions such as retail banking, L&D, talent, and people capability. In his current role as Global Head of Non-Mandatory Learning at Standard Charter, he is leading a hive to enable people to be the best in their job roles at ACT. Suman helps the organizations to cultivate a culture of continuous learning and growth while empowering businesses and people to drive performance with transformative skills and experiences. We have with us John Chirion, who is CEO of N Paradigm, who is driven by the potential of purpose-driven business to make the world more meaningful. His endeavor to make the complex simple and his belief in the power of learning to make people and businesses better has been the significant driving force in the end paradigm journey. A journey that brings together business thought, learning methodology and user experience into our technology driven learning platforms. The understanding of unconscious competence and how to help businesses get there is his field of permanent study. So without further ado, let me invite both Suman and John to share their insights and views on our topic for today, talent management and development for the future of work. So Suman, I'd like to start with you first. In your opinion, what are the trends that will be the driving talent management and development function in 2023 and beyond? Thank you. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting question. I think um, a lot of organization, if you look at, uh, has been really focusing on making talent as a key part of their strategy. And, and uh, it's not about how we look at talent. I think one of the biggest change and trends that is emerging over the period of time is reinventing the purpose of talent. I think uh, it, it's, it's an important thing. Uh, and if I, if I reflect on a few, few years uh, from now, I think a couple of things that I see emerging in a very strong way from the talent perspective. The first one is what we are looking at saying, getting talent for the purpose of commercial outcome in the organization. Now, let me let me give you a bit of what I mean by this. Uh, traditionally, if you look at talent and an HR functions strategy around talent, it's about really looking at, looking at how do we get the best out of our people, get them development, get them growth, uh, you know, help them stick into the organization. I think there's a significant shift and trend now where the purpose is to really look at are we making our talent purposeful in consideration of the commercial outcome that we are looking. Okay. It's, a, it's a huge change from pure development to getting commercial value off from your talent. That's one. The second thing um, is, is a lot of things mm -hmm. that's going around between what we kind of call as a sunset role or a sunshine role, right? There's a significant amount of workforce in any organization who will probably move into a sunset role because of various reasons, whether it's automation, whether it's technology, innovation, transformation. In those circumstances, one of the biggest trend that the organizations are moving towards from a talent standpoint is about reskilling workforce. And if you if you have a right reskilling strategy, you have a better cost architecture in managing your, your talent. And it's a huge value to your commercial overall commercial outcome. So reskilling is the second key trend that I see is emerging from the talent perspective. Mm -hmm. The third one is uh, today with uh, 
post COVID and I think even before COVID things were getting into a shape where you know we are kind of there's a blur between the boundaries that we used to have for talent right I mean there was a time when people used to say you are a great talent let's say for example in China you'll only work in China mm. right you'll, you'll, you'll continue to get different opportunity in China um, it is changing now I think talent talent is is open everywhere geographically the boundaries are going off so if I'm looking for a talent in Vietnam to come to Singapore or do a work for me in Singapore or or the talent in Vietnam staying in Vietnam but doing go global role that trend is now becoming big yeah. so so we have a bigger marketplace to look for talent the fourth one is is quite an interesting thing um, that we have been kind of quite invested on is about what we call as talent marketplace now this is this is another way of looking at how do you really help within your organization shape talent outside just the strategic agenda that you have so talent marketplace is an open place and let me give you an example let's say for example i i have a i have a particular set of uh, you know a project that i'm running in my corporate and institutional banking and i need few skills but i need them only for a couple of week or a couple of months i don't need to go out there and hire someone because hiring is a cost hiring is a lot of time that it requires for these kind of smaller skills you can open it up internally in your talent marketplace so people talent marketplace is not exactly a shift of job but it's an opportunity to enhance or sharpen your skill in something else within within your organization and you still continue to remain there mm -hmm. um, we have seen significant growth in that level and i think a significant amount of our cost that goes in hiring talent uh, externally for these kind of work has kind of balanced out big way so I think these are these are four big things the last thing uh, that I see the fifth one which is um, a lot of us are already kind of familiar with is about how technology is helping us to really shape the talent agenda I think um, a yeah. couple of years ago uh, it looks very theoretical in paper from a talent perspective I think today technology is emerging in a big way and 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 it's kind of really challenging how one how we identify potential and the reason I'm using potential is because I feel a talent is not just about what you're doing in your job it's about the potential you want to sh you've shown in in things that you can do so you have the right right models the right technology that helps you to identify talent you have the right technology that will help put a talent acceleration plan uh, for for people and the most important thing that technology can give you is is really about analytics the data side yes. of it which is a huge thing I mean uh, the trend that can really change how we look at this is going to be how we interpret data and how do we bring in analytics into the play and talent thing so I think these are a few things that I'm I'm kind of observing uh, is, is, is the emerging talent trends in the market. I think you've kind of touched upon all the key trends that we have seen. I think the world is talking about them, especially when you said aligning business with yeah. people, uh, people goals, people skilling goals with business goals. I think that's how you move forward because it's no longer just about developing talent but finding that purpose for them. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You spoke about reskilling. You spoke about the talent marketplace having a larger global, you know, talent pool now that people can work with, and also about how. You know, I think these are very interesting inputs. John, I would like to hear you now. Since, you know, I think someone has very beautifully put down these trends. What are your thoughts on what trends will be impacting the whole talent development space today? So, uh, I think we heard Suman talking about the, the commercial outcome of the learning function. Yes. Right. And uh, that's a very key trend, right? So, traditionally, what has happened is that organizations are very strong at helping their people uh, understand KRAs, KPIs the outcomes that we expect from people at work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the layer behind that uh, is in terms of what skills, capabilities, competencies do people need to deliver those outcomes. right? And a lot of focus historically has been on the outcome. We expect you to deliver these outcomes at work. Okay. right? Today, a lot of focus is shifting from, uh, or let me put it this way, right? many of the outcomes that we're talking about are uh, in the talent management function, talent development function, many of these outcomes are lag metrics they are outcomes mm -hmm. right uh, what we need to look at in the talent development function are the lead metrics right what are the skills what are the capabilities what are the inputs that are going into the process for the person to deliver that kind of an outcome okay. right uh, and in our work what we've seen is that typically in any large organization you have more than 100 key roles across functions and for each role there are maybe 25 to 30 different unique skill sets or capabilities Right. And you need to have a very fine calibration of 
which role, what skill set, what proficiency level do we expect from talent to have mm-hmm. in that skill set, mm-hmm. right? And it really depends on what role they are playing today. Uh, and talent is, developing talent is never a fast job. You can't, you know, just tell, tell someone to develop a skill overnight. It takes time, right? Which means the talent development function has to take a slightly more long-term view mm-hmm. in terms of what is this person doing today? What role do we see that person playing into the future? And therefore, how to help that person get there, yeah. right? Uh, and that is where, when if you expect a commercial outcome from a person at this point in time, you know, you have to look at the pathway from where they are today to where they are, yeah. right? And a lot of the tools that we use in terms of assessing people, in terms of developing people, in terms of calibrating that uh, that roadmap, that becomes very important, yeah. right? So I believe it starts with the human side of it, understanding how human beings learn, how human beings develop talent, skill. Mm-hmm. Uh, it starts there. And then we look at, okay, what are the tools that can help us get there, right? Mm-hmm. And technology obviously becomes a very important aid. Absolutely. And today, uh, the best part about this space today is that there's been a lot of, uh, huge amount of new technology that's coming out. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of technology in the space of immersive AI. We've seen a lot of technology in the space of uh, generative AI. Mm-hmm. which is actually helping us do the job of, you know, uh, helping talent move along that spectrum, right? When it comes to technology, historic, historically, we've been used to what we call point-in-time solutions, right? So what's a point-in-time solution? If I want to know where a person is currently on that talent roadmap, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I assess them at this point in time, mm-hmm. right? And I can give them feedback saying, this is where you stand today, okay. right? And historically, we've been used to solutions which are, always been point in time. You know, I can assess you here, then I will try and develop you with again point in time solutions. It could be a workshop, it could be an e-learning module. Uh, so that's how we've been doing it, right? Okay. But the need of the hour, with the moment you see it as a roadmap or a pathway, is not a point in time solution, right? Mm-hmm. It's about continuous assessment, continuous development, continuous learning, right? Uh, and that becomes a very different ball game. Yeah. And historically, this piece has been uh, really difficult for us to do. Mm. Right, uh, because you, uh, they say, right, it takes a village to raise a child. Right, so if you look at a talent, it takes a lot of energy and effort from the talent management function mm. to be able to provide continuous inputs. But today we are seeing a lot of technologies actually helping in bringing that continuous learning and that continuous assessment and development outcome for the function. Yeah. Right, and uh, I'm very excited about what, what all I've seen yeah. in the last couple of years. So, uh, John, are you also seeing a bit of uh, moving from hiring for skills rather than hiring for roles now? Okay. Yeah, there's been a lot of conversation around that. Mm-hmm. Uh, honestly, that's easier to talk about. Yeah, right? difficult to practice. But, uh, you know, so when we when we evaluate talent, you know, uh, you know, you look at so many different signals, right? So many different markers of mm-hmm. how do we know whether the talent actually has that capability. Mm. Right. Exactly, yeah. And uh, a lot of times you end up having to go by the signals of the markers. What degrees do they have? What previous work experience do they have? Mm-hmm. What are the keywords in their resume? Right? A lot of those are markers because we don't have infinite time to assess the person. Exactly, yeah. Right? Uh, but there's definitely a trend. There's definitely a shift in mm-hmm. saying, you know, okay, I see that this is your background, but let me myself assess for skills. Mm-hmm. Right? And see if you have those skills before we give that role to you. True. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a work in progress. Yeah. yeah. And then we have to create the whole journey, as you said, and, and look at the long term view of it. So interesting points. So, but what are some of the challenges that you've seen in the space, especially you know, uh, while you're creating a talent roadmap or a journey for the for your, any of your role, talent people in the organization? What challenges do you usually face? Yeah. So, like you said, I think historically the challenge has been the availability of more point in time tools. Yeah. Versus having continuous learning tools. Yeah, exactly. Right? So that's been a challenge and, you know, I think companies are now finding more and more tools over there. Mm. Uh, the other major challenge uh, that I would like to talk about is, you know, that today we are in a very different world from the pre-COVID year. Mm-hmm. Right? We are in a world where there's high inflation, you know, uh, apparently there's a recession, uh, but no one's really able to pin it down Not clearly. Really. Yeah. Right? Uh, there's a still a huge demand for talent. Right. But at, on the other hand, you are seeing also a lot of layoffs. Exactly. Right. Uh, so uh, the space is a little murky. Right. Uh, and for the talent development function, therefore, you know, uh, how do we, what is the kind of message that we are going to give talent? Right. Are we going to give a very growth oriented message to talent? 
or are we going to give a cautious message to talent, right? And I'd probably want to ask Suman about this because I'm yeah. sure this, yeah. this is something that he probably thinks about a lot. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, see, yeah. Um, I, I have a slightly different view of how how the talent uh, piece has been kind of emerging and it's going to be very critical. Uh, to your question earlier, you know, I think um, it's what we what what we've seen or we are kind of really looking at is not hiring people and you touched upon it not hiring people for roles but you, you hire people for skills exactly. um, now the important thing about skill is again uh, you know i think at times we just over over kind of complicated by putting everything under the talent umbrella um, it's it's important to understand that your skill is all about relevance right yes. and, and that's that's the key thing uh, if you have a skill today and it's not relevant tomorrow, you are unskilled. So, so what that really means is, if you have to really identify talent, I think the biggest challenge that most of the organizations are finding and will continue to find, I feel, is that how do you define your architecture of skill relevancy? Right, that's a very important thing. Uh, if you are someone who is articulating your job with competency, you are out for failure. Uh, and our competencies are outdated. Nobody looks at competence. It's a theoretical stuff. You need to have practical application skill articulation in your job objectives, in, in the way you define the job descriptions. Mm -hmm. So a huge, huge thing that is really pushing uh, the, the industry across is uh, how do we ensure that we get people with skill? Uh, and, and then you go to the list level saying, look, how do we keep those skills relevant? Because relevancy is, is key it's for, key, key, yeah. is absolutely key for skills. And I think that is why I feel that um, the talent change, change in the dynamics of talent is a big one. It's, mm. it's emerging every single time and, and it, there's no easy answer to fix it. Mm. Suman, I'll come to you again because, you know, you work for a large organization. Have you seen the, any change in the expectations that employers have, employees have from their employees, especially in this whole hybrid, remote, anywhere, anytime kind of work model that we are living in? Yes, very much. I think uh, one, one of the things that's uh, been now talked about more openly is well-being, right? I mean, yes. we have heard about it everywhere. People, people are now openly talking about that, look, I, I need to really understand what's my well-being. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a fundamental expectation that everybody is now having. So if you are an employer and if you are, you know, those earlier days of conkling where you say, look, you need to work 12 hours, 15 hours, you know, this is the model of working. I, I think those are going off, right? I think people, people's expectation first is that I need to really understand my well-being and I expect my employer to appreciate and, and give me that platform and environment where I can really exhibit that bit. That's one on the well-being side. The second important thing and, and links to the discussions we had about scale, I think a lot of expectations are now saying, where do I get that opportunity to continue to sharpen my skills? Yeah. So I think, um, and I've seen this at a very senior level in, in organizations where even, even at a CEO level, people are looking at opportunity to sharpen their skills because the dynamics are changing. So the expectation from, the, from your employer is to provide that environment, provide that whole thing. Uh, and, and the third, third thing is, is really about, it's, it's a more about looking at what opportunity do I have to grow myself mm. um, and, and how the, the organization is helping me to do that. Mm. And, and, and I'll tell you, I don't want to name a company, but recently I was reading an article, very interesting thing, uh, that company had a, uh, in a policy where they were kind of talking to all their new hires and saying, look, we provide you an environment where we'll build your skills, we'll do, we don't mind if you get a better opportunity and go as a result of the skills you've built in the organization. So I think, I think a lot of these, these are kind of quite a different way uh, of, of looking, at, looking at how things are emerging. So as an employee, my expectation uh, is it's changing. Um, one other aspect which we talk a lot in our organization is about what we call is uh, at the core of everything we do is, is, hu is being human, right? Yes. I think um, we need to really understand sentiments. We need to understand emotions. We need to treat people differently. Uh, and every individual is different. That's why my, this is my personal view and always feel that everybody joins the organization to be successful. Nobody joins to fail, right? Number one. Number two, everyone is talented. There's, there's a talent in everyone. Um, the, the whole appearance of the talent might look different and it is up to the organization how the shape bring that out. And the third thing uh, as an expectation that I see very important from, from a employer is about the whole ecosystem and the environment. Am I in a safe environment? 
Do I have the right to voice what I think in my mind? Am I allowed to fail? You know, if I fail, how will you treat me? You know, I think a, a lot of these transformational thinking yes. is now emerging as an expectation from employees uh, to a large extent. I think that's very interesting because, as you said, everybody wants to become more relevant. Everybody yeah. wants to become, they want to stay in the market for longer. So they are, they are looking at opportunities where employers can help them hone those skills and, you know, prepare them for the future. So on that note, John, I'll ask you first, what do you think will be the top three skills that will power the future of work? I think very interesting question. Uh, and... Uh, it's always difficult to come up with only three when yeah. you know there are 25. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I think there are a few things which are disproportionately important for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. One aspect is the fact that because uh, everything around us is going so so digital, right? And we just heard human talking about uh, you know human humanizing, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the core of human is uh, definitely understanding the empathy. Uh, being able to empathize with someone. Absolutely. Right. So developing that empathy for things around you and being able to put yourself in multiple shoes. Right. It could be the shoes of your peer, your boss, your team member, uh, your customer, your vendor. Mm -hmm. Right. Someone in a different country, in a different state. You know, that is empathy. Right. So empathy should not be seen only as a, you know, uh, as something that HR talk about really. Yeah, right. absolutely. Empathy is very important for every function to do better in what it does because if you're able to relate and understand to what's happening across the table, mm. the solution that you're going to provide uh, is a lot more holistic. Right. So I would definitely highlight empathy as absolutely. number one, uh, whichever function you're in. Uh, number two is your ability to uh, be digital and manage data. Uh, you know, very crucial. Now, what happens is that, you know, for many of us, you know, uh, our fear of max in school <laughs> ends up being a fear of data in corporate. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Uh, and that's that's very unfortunate, right? Because the education system brings you up in a way where you either develop your left brain analytical, logical skills a lot, or you develop your right brain creative, intuitive skills, right? Uh, but many times, by the time you come into a senior corporate role, your ability to integrate the two of them is what makes a difference. Very important, yes. Right. So do you have empathy? Do you understand the world around you? Do you understand the challenges, right, on one hand? Mm -hmm. At the same time, are you able to create structure, logic? Are you able to use data to make decisions, uh, mm -hmm. understand the world around you again? Mm -hmm. That becomes very important, mm -hmm. right? And I think being able to, uh, you know, be very comfortable with data, being very comfortable with reading data and understanding what data is not telling you, understanding what data is telling you, maybe not over analyzing. Absolutely. You know, some of those skills become become mm -hmm. very important. And in our work, we found that that's a very diff difficult skill for people. It right? is. Yeah. People go wrong with data all the time, mm -hmm. yeah. and they make uh, they come to certain conclusions, but when they present it back to management, then you know management has a very different view yeah. of the same data, yeah. right? So that becomes... Understand data is becomes, very critical then. No. Right. That becomes very challenging. And I also talked about digital. Yeah. Generally being able to go digital simply because digital brings in a very different lever of efficiency, effectiveness. Yes. Right. Uh, I spoke about AI. Right. Now AI for, I think almost everyone is a big unknown. Yeah. What AI is, how does it work? Again, becomes very, very difficult for, you know, the everyday worker to kind of understand. Mm. Right. Uh, so being able to understand what it really is and what it's not, what it can do, what it can't do, uh, again, that becomes a very, very critical skill set. Yes, it right? is. And the challenge in this skill set is, you know, every three months you realize that now AI can do something that it couldn't do earlier. Yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> but it's not like it, it can do it perfectly. Right? There are still challenges. Yeah. Right? So these are the top three skills. So in the times of chat GPT, what are your views? <laughs> <laughs> how many jobs are at stake <laughs> yeah in fact that's something that I ask a lot of people have yeah. you asked chat GPT whether it's going to take your job yeah <laughs> right? and it'll be interesting to see what it's going to tell you yeah yeah, yeah. hopefully not yeah. <laughs> on that note Suman what about you top yeah. three skills I mean I, I completely agree with what John said I think these are, these are absolutely critical skills um, so my take on this is I think there are there are fundamentally a slightly different shade of kind of uh, 
I'll, I'll go a bit of non-technical uh, thing. Mm. I mean, John X uh, beautifully mentioned about the technical stuff on digital data, absolutely. Uh, I think for me, there are there's a very important emerging skill. I don't know whether there's a skill or uh, but that, I think without this, you can't succeed. And, and that's about collaboration. I mean, uh, the, the big change in the organization is that we cannot succeed in silos. Whatever work you do, wherever you are sitting in the world, if you do not have a collaborative skill, mm. you are out there for struggle, right? Mm. And, and it's not easy. Collaboration is cross-functional, cross-boundary. So I think, I think we need to genuinely invest on ourselves to build that skill. That's, 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 that's one. The second one is, again, uh, which, which I believe is a very key skill in, in an ever-changing world is about prioritization. How do you prioritize things? You can't do everything in the world. I think we, we are getting into a space where rapidly things are changing. We have a huge book of work in wherever we are working, wherever we are doing. Uh, you know, if you, if you want to be successful, you need to make some bold decisions, right? And the bold decisions are about really looking at where you can create maximum value. Yeah. So, so you need to keep sharpening your skills around prioritization, making the right decisions to prioritize the right thing for yourself and for your organization. And the third one is largely a combination of what I call a stewardship and leadership. Uh, and um, so what, what does really mean? I mean, we often think that leadership is only when you have people in your teams. That's not the case. Leadership is changing significantly. Leadership is more now an individual skill, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think... Um, if you don't have the right leadership, and there are many things goes inside it, but for me, it's about leadership is about connecting with people, right? If you connect people, if you connect environment, connect work with people, and it's a very individual skill of how you bring all of this together. And stewardship attached to leadership is about being accountable to every bug that you are responsible for. Nice. Uh, and, and I think that's, these are skills uh, which, will, which will, I think, uh, uh, decorate the element together with what John mentioned about the technical skills. Yeah, I think those are some great points. I think prioritization is a skill I have not really heard about. So this is a new one and I think it's interesting because a lot of people with the burnout that's happening around, uh, th this is a skill that they could learn, they would be, you know, we have to prioritize, in a lot yeah. of ways. Every, yeah. every step in our life, we have choices, yes, right? Yes. You need to really prioritize which way to go. Absolutely. Because if you, if you think that, no, I'm going to do all the things you cannot do. No. So uh, you will not add value. Yeah. yeah. Great, great. And as John also rightly pointed, I think empathy, digital skills, data analytics skills. Then, as as you pointed out, collaboration very important in the hybrid work. Prioritization, leadership, have being a, a steward and a leader at the same time. Great skills. I think all of, all the viewers who are watching this will know that these are the skills of the future which will help them remain relevant no matter what. Mm -hmm. So, Suman, I'll come to you again with my final question. How can we solidify the learning infrastructure and, and develop and nurture the existing pool of talent, making them future ready and also creating a culture of continuous learning? Well, this is my favorite topic. Let, mm -hmm. me, let, me, let me tell you this. I think... Sure. Um, and, and um, see, I started my work life in the business, so I've, I've done multiple roles in the business and before moving into the L&D space. Um, and one of the things that I've, I'm continuously learning mm. about learning is that uh, we need to be left field in our thinking. So what, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. For me, learning is not about a training program. Learning is not about doing a course. Learning is not about going and doing digital stuff or, or a workshop. Learning is about an environment that you need to create for people to play, apply, reflect, and learn. So learn is probably for me is the last thing. I think what you, what you really need to create an environment where people get an opportunity to really come and play into this. This is about building experiences. And, I, and, and I'll give you an example. If I, if I tell you that without giving you any context, right? I don't give you any context. I don't tell you to go and do any program. Mm. But I bring it to, a, to, to you and a couple of other people in a room and say, look, here are three problems you need to solve. The human beings are super powerful, right? You know, the beauty about human beings is that they're so powerful that you will find your ways to solve this problem. You'll find your own ways to do that. I don't need to help you to learn. So the environment that we need to create for people to learn is an environment where people can experience, where people get feedback. So when you are solving this problem, you need to get feedback from people. Somebody should tell you, yeah, this is great, but you could have done something probably X. That's your learning. Yeah. That is not something you'll get in a course. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so for me, the environment in learning is about really creating that experiential setup. Absolutely. That's very good. The second point on learning is, I think one of the key member who can really drive this learning is the people leaders. And, and, and that's a very important aspect. Uh, we all have people leaders, right? We all have our bosses. Uh, uh, so I think the beauty about your learning is that how well your people leaders align to providing you that setup, right? I think that is why I urge, uh, you know, to my team and, and, and I've seen in many other organizations now gradually investing a lot in preparing people leader as a resource. Mm -hmm. And we haven't thought people leader as a resource in the past, especially in a learning context. You actually think it's a job of L&D. No, it's not the job of an L&D. Mm -hmm. It is the job of the people leader together with the employee to create that environment. Absolutely. So so that is the second point on, of how you create create that infrastructure. And the third important point, I think, within, within that whole setup is about democratizing learning. And democratizing learning means what? Everyone has a different learning needs. Yeah. Everyone learn differently. And we need to create the setup that can help you address that. Yes. So it's a simple thing. For example, people like me, you know, if you put me in a, in a, in a classroom, somebody is giving a big lecture, might be respectable or whatever it is, I will not learn. That's not my method of learning exactly. you put me in a mess you put me in a situation you put me in something i will learn faster you know there will be someone who might say no no i don't want to go there i want someone to tell me what to be done i learn that way so i think this whole thing about really understanding the styles of learning um the and in and, and what proportion they really learn uh, is an important dynamics to solve if you're really creating a setup learning setup that you're looking for yeah, I think I totally agree about uh, self-paced learning and democratizing learning because, as you said, uh, aligning an individual's goal with your learning initiatives is very important for an organization today. Yeah. Uh, would you like to add something to that, John? Because we are trying to create a future-ready workforce, but learning needs are so different, right? And can you hyper-personalize there? Can you actually customize there? And how can you create a future-ready workforce? Yeah, so I'd like to maybe take a few points from what Suman has been mm. talking about, right? Mm. One is the the aspect of, you know, the humanness out yeah, of it. Absolutely, right? yeah. How do, you, uh, how do you look at learning from a human perspective, right? And, uh, you know, many times, you know, we, we you know, uh, in Hindi we have this word ulta, right? Which is basically you're doing it backward, yeah. right? So basically what are we trying to say? A lot of times what happens is that, you know, we structure a learning curriculum, we make it very formal. And we give people very curated learning and input, mm. right? But the way we really learn is, you know, that you face a problem, you face a challenge. Yeah. Hands right? on. Yeah. And then you couldn't solve that problem. And you start thinking, oh my God, I, I didn't get something right. There's something missing. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's where that play yeah. play piece comes True. and becomes so important, right? True. And then you, you, you keep finding the same problem again and again. You see the patterns. And then you realize that there is probably a, an approach which can help you achieve for all the variants or all the differences in patterns that you see, yeah. right? And that becomes what you learn. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the theory mm. from, yeah. right? So theory comes from practice, right? True. But many times when we are in learning, practice seems to follow theory. Yeah, it no. doesn't really work that yeah. way. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't right? not anymore, yeah. So even as organizations, how do we provide these playgrounds to our learners, right? Now, uh, this sounds great to be saying on video, Right. But in practice, this becomes a very, very difficult job. Absolutely. Right. So why isn't experiential learning, uh, the percentage of experiential learning far higher than it really is? Because it's not easy to create that environment. Right. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing is to create those experiential learning environments for companies. Lovely. So that people are able to do that exactly what Suman mentioned. Right. People are able to get their hands dirty. Yeah. They experience problems, situations, challenges. And then, you know, you get them thinking. You know, I thought I did a great job, but I realized that, no, I'm not able to solve that challenge. Mm. Right? And many times in adult learning, the problem is, as adults, we are not naturally open to learning, necessarily. Mm. Right? Why? Because we're all people with 10, 15, 20 years of experience. Mm. Uh, we all have a good opinion about what our capability is. Mm -hmm. And we are strong in certain areas, but at the same time, we have blind spots. We do. Right. And it becomes difficult for the learning function to help people with their blind spots. Yeah. Right. Because by nature, they are blind. Yeah. Right. And that is where play becomes very important. Because when we play, we go back into that childlike mindset. Right. And we let down our guard. We are more open. We are more curious. Experimental. We are more experimental. Yeah. And that's a beautiful time to just get 
whatever learning into the head. Beautiful. Right? Now, when it comes to learning infrastructure, how do you build in learning infrastructure that can do this? Mm. Right? It becomes a very, very critical role. Right? Do we have technology that can support us in this endeavor? Exactly. Right? Uh, unfortunately, today, if you look at most of the learning technology and most of the learning content out there, uh, it's all in that, you know, I'm going to give you expert input kind of a uh, mm. mode. Mm. Right? It's very carefully curated, great content, uh, you know, very value adding, mm. but it may not fit into the way human beings actually learn, mm. uh, particularly adults, mm. right? And there's a big need to invert that, Absolutely, that mode, yes. right? So how do you evaluate technology that helps you build those playgrounds? Uh, and how do you make, uh, you know, learning in a sense also non-threatening to the, mm. to the, to the person, right? Uh, same problem, right? When we are adults, right, uh, it's not easy to admit that, you know, there's something that we don't know. <laughs> right it's not easy to look at an assessment uh, you know that saying that you are actually low on these sca these mm. skills mm. right it becomes very difficult it does right and for the learning function it creates a lot of friction because the learning function is trying to give assessments to people and no one wants to take them mm -hmm. right they find a lot of reasons not to take those assessments yeah right so that whole you know how how can we help assess you how can we help develop you you know how do you frame that conversation to an adult learner how do you frame that conversation to someone who is in a mid or a senior role in a large mm -hmm. organization, yeah. right? How do you bring in that developmental angle? Mm -hmm. How do you bring in the play angle? How do you bring in the experimentation angle? It's very important. Right? All those things become very important. Today, we are seeing a lot of organizations evolving into that kind of an approach. Yes. Right? And equally also trying to get the tools which can support that kind of a message mm -hmm. to adult learners. Yeah. Right? I think that... Yeah. You know, when it comes to learning infrastructure, I think some of this becomes very critical in being able to get the final outcome that yeah. we want. Because you can invest all you want in infra, but if the the user is not going to use it, uh, it doesn't really help. Yeah. It doesn't build capability. Yeah. Two, two quick points on this. I think it's a very interesting thing. Um, one is we need to shift our thinking from content to context. Absolutely. Right? Content is available everywhere. Right? You go to you, you, Google, you'll get th thousands of stuff. So there is no scarcity of good content. Context is important. That talks to the adoption of how people will adopt this learning. Unless the context is clear for people, the question of why, you know, to keep asking why, 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 till you get to that context. Second, a very important, I call it as an infrastructure, though it's not a physical infrastructure, but uh, environmental infrastructure of giving and receiving feedback is is core to learning absolutely if if you are able to set up that you don't need to do anything else trust me it's the biggest learning people can have in a safe environment when you get feedback mm. you you ask for feedback you get give feedback that's the biggest i would say uh, you know non infrastructural infrastructure that you can really build in learning Lovely points. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think eventually learning is all about a mindset. It's all about having that learning agility yeah. because everybody wants to grow in their careers. Organizations want their people to grow also. The whole talent development space that way is evolving majorly on, on a daily basis. Yeah. So if we are agile, if we are adaptive by nature, I think, uh, and we have that learning mindset and we know that learning by doing is something that can help us become better and future ready, that's the way to be. And I think organizations and employees together can build that. So on that note, thank you so much, John. Thank you, thank you so much for joining thank us for so this much. conversation. Uh, there was so much to learn from the both of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah.